You're listening to the Walled Garden Podcast. This podcast is a part of the Walled Garden Online Community, a community dedicated to sharing and discussing philosophy, beliefs, ideas, and creativity among all types of people in order to gain new insight on some of life's biggest questions and make the most of how we live. We appreciate you joining us. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Walled Garden Podcast. So today I have on the show Professor Joseph Siracusa. If you haven't already listened to my conversations with him in the past on the show, then I highly recommend that you do so because uh, uh, Joe is really, he's a brilliant mind. You know, hes uh, he's got a memory unlike anybody I've ever known. Uh, he's got such a wisdom about the way that he approaches history and diplomacy and, um, and war and all of these, you know, really in-depth topics that <laughs> require a lifetime of experience to get to the bottom of. Uh, and perhaps not even then, but uh, Joseph really seems to have a wisdom about the way that he approaches these topics, and that's why I love speaking with him. And obviously this year we saw the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Centers, and so when when Joseph and I were discussing potential topics for uh, our discussions, we thought, let's let's dive into this, because I, I, I don't personally know anyone who has a better grip on the uh, history leading up to those attacks, as well as the uh, the history afterwards, the, the, the aftermath of those attacks. And so really what you're getting in today's episode is uh, less of a conversation and more of a university grade lecture uh, on the, you know, the history, the uh, the event and the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. And so I don't want to take any more time in this introduction other than to say that we're very lucky to have Joseph Siracusi here. He is an expert on international diplomacy. He's an expert on nuclear weapons and their history, and he's very highly regarded all around the world for his insights uh, on politics, uh, current events and war and all sorts of other things. So very lucky to have him here, and I want to present to you this in-depth analysis of the 9-11 attacks and their aftermath with Professor Joseph Siracusa. I guess uh, the first thing that I need to mention for everybody who's going to listen to this, uh, we are graced by Professor Joseph Siracusa's presence, not only uh, just on a regular uh, podcast interview that we're doing, but on the day that Melbourne has had this uh, terrible earthquake. So, uh, Joe, thank you so much for even, you know, taking the time in in this wild day. I know things are getting pretty biblical in Australia, um, but uh, nonetheless, today we're we're focusing on uh, on nine eleven, uh, of course, the twentieth anniversary since the attack. And uh, honestly, what I'm what I'm looking forward to in this conversation is really just hearing your perspective. You've got this uh, wealth of understanding of diplomacy, international governments, war, history, uh, all these things that really, um, basically, I want to know how you see the past 20 years. And I think that I might as well just start by asking you uh, to take us from the start of when it happened, where were you, what was your general feeling at that time? And and then I want you to take this wherever you go and, and we'll see where we end up. There is a... Uh condition called hypernesia, uh, with which people can remember exactly where they were when something wonderful happened or something terrible. This is how uh, uh, Jewish prisoners in concentration camps had total recall at trials. This is where people can remember exactly where they were when they heard that President Kennedy was shot or they were watching the thing on television. Uh, 9-11 was like that too. I've been in Australia 48 years, and I was at the University of Queensland in those days, and I was in Brisbane. And I was watching my favorite evening news, Sandra Sully, on Channel 10. And it's about, I'm watching the 1030 news. And I did a lot of work with the 7, 9, and 10 in those days. I knew everybody. And so she was reading the news, and then at a quarter to 11, midway through the, the news, she says, we have a breaking bulletin. A, uh, a plane or an explosion has hit the World Trade Center. And uh, this was not news to me. I was following uh, uh, news of possible terrorist attack all summer. There was all kinds of chatter in the American uh, 
intelligence agencies leaked to the American news, et cetera. And I thought, what an unusual place for an airplane uh, for an airplane to crash into. There'd been an airplane crash years ago into the uh, Empire State Building, quite by accident. So I think it was a DC-3. And then I'm watching the show. And about 15 minutes later, I see the second plane go in. And then they, they, they go back to CNN. And they go flash over to CNN. And CNN says, America under attack. And that became the theme of the Bush administration's uh, policy for days and years to follow. America under attack. And, and one of the first things you see, you, you wonder is, where, where's the president? Well, the president is hunkering down somewhere. And the, depra- the uh, vice president is, uh, is in a bunker in the White House as all part of the continuity of government plan. During a nuclear year, during the, the height of the Cold War, in the event of a nuclear attack, which is always real, the government would go underground into tunnels or into, into bunkers. We wouldn't. You know, we were told to go to our, our fallout shelter and, you know, have plenty of water, candle soup, and, and a transistor radio. You know, that, that, that idea that governments survive and normal people die is what got the right wing going in America. This is the prepper movement. It began in the 60s and 70s and 80s about there ain't no room for me in the event of doomsday. So I'm going to take care of myself. Now, we see that America is under attack. And we also see that uh, the American government is getting most of its information from television. CNN's got a better handle on this than the American government. And they're quoting CNN, you know, and CNN reports that um, there's uh, a plane has gone in the Pentagon. Well, there have been two planes on the on the World Trade Center, uh, which then starts to fall beyond all imagination. I, I watched the Trade Center go up when I was working for Merrill Lynch back in the day across the river. I was watching it go up a while. And, and so then we have an attack on the Pentagon. And then we got another plane over Pennsylvania. But by now, the American government, the Federal uh, Aviation Authority, has cleared American airspace. Every American plane is diverted. Most of them landed in Canada, if you can believe that. And so they're looking for what's left. And there's a plane over Pennsylvania that's obviously headed for Congress or the White House. And, And... and we don't know what's on board. You know, there might even be heavy, there might even be a bomb, for God's sakes. We, we, we don't know. But the imagination is starting to play out. Uh, the, the government has, has gone into a, a worst case scenario. But keep in mind that that CNN headline, America under attack. Well, before the afternoon is out, before the, uh, the American morning is out, a plane uh, is driven into the ground in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, apparently. Number of the passengers overwhelmed on the crew. And it turns out that the title America Under Attack is simply 19 Islamist extremists with box cutters who talked their way into first class flights in the United States. And I'm thinking, are we really under attack or is this four planes, three targets? 19 box guys carrying box cutters. These are 19 guys with a mission. What's the mission? Well, you know, uh, they are Islamist extremists, you know, they have the Sunni variety, and they may have even been financed by Saudis, that is, a Wahhabi um, charities and things like that. And it turns out their leader is a guy named Osama bin Laden, who at the age of 23 years old, Born in Saudi Arabia. And um, he is, and I'll just double check this because your audience isn't going to believe this. I barely sure. believed it when I looked at this thing again. Yes, he was the 17th of 57 children by one single construction magnate, Saudi magnate. I mean, Freud would have a field day right there, 17th of 57 kids. Jeez. 
And this is uh, the famous 9-11 commission report, which I'll talk about in a minute too. So he's the leader of this, this, uh, this, this thing. And um, it, it turns out that uh, the intelligence people had enough information, but they weren't able to connect the dots. Now, today we have in the United States 16 intelligence organizations, which attract a budget of $85 billion. Now, one of the first recommendations of the 9-11 Commission report was to get intelligence agencies to talk to each other and even create a Department of Homeland Security. So what we did after 9-11, because we thought intelligence was the way to go with this, is we, we took all these incompetent intelligence agencies and put them into one huge incompetent intelligence agency, and we call it the Department of Homeland Security. Okay? And so now we got incompetence is now codified by law with, with these people. And we we start to uh, we start to get people uh, put it put them in place. Now the thing with 9-11 is this we we we, we have a conflict we hadn't counted on in the sense of them coming to us. It's what I call most of our, our, our deprivations in the world are away games, whether it's imperialism, capitalism, communism. Usually it's an away game. This was a home game. They decided to come home to us. And they came home to us on American um, airlines. Now, later on, when uh, Bush's uh, national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice, says to Congress, it never occurred to me anyone was going to use an airplane to attack a building. I'm thinking to myself, well, I, I go back to May 1945, April 1945, when the Japanese unleashed 3,500 kamikaze pilots on the American fleet on its way to Japan. And they used these, these kamikaze pilots to attack these uh, aircraft carriers and frigates and all the rest of it. And these young men were terrific. You know, there was a, a great myth, mythology about the Japanese uh, because of our racial bias that they, they didn't know how to operate airplanes correctly. They had inner ear, uh, inner, inner ear tube infections. They, they, they were not eye hand coordination, et cetera. And it turns out that they were pretty good. They were pretty good. And they, with limited training, they went from about 30,000 feet and they found a, a, a plane. They found a, a boat off of Okinawa and they were able to hit it head on when they sunk the, uh, uh, the uh, USS uh, Bunker. And, and, and so when, when Condoleezza Rice, who has a PhD in history from the University of Denver, says, it never occurred to me anyone to use a plane to attack a target. I'm thinking, well, what, what's, what's wrong with this picture? Now, the 9-11 Commission report was chaired by a number of top politicians. And the actual report was headed up by a friend of mine, Ernest May, now passed away at Harvard. Uh, Ernest May was a great international relations historian. Uh, he was also my tennis partner at Harvard for two years, I believe. Great guy. And so he's writing this report. And the conclusion is, or it begins with, uh, we were shocked, but we should not be surprised because there was a lot of warning. And keep in mind that every intelligence agency since 1945 in the United States was designed and paid for to avoid Pearl Harbor. That's when it got serious. After Pearl Harbor, which had 11 commissions, none of which found out who screwed up, okay? They all screwed up. After Pearl Harbor, the Department of uh, uh, State was supposed to have a, a, a board or a section that was supposed to look at all threats coming through, policy planning staff. Every intelligence agency was designed to avoid the next Pearl Harbor. So here we have these guys, four airplanes, 19 uh, Islamic uh, extremists, guys with box cutters, accessing American airspace. And, you know, and they weren't very polite. When they got up to first class, they cut everybody's throats. It's a deal with the box cutters. They're cutting everybody's throat. And they're keeping everybody at bay. And nobody has a gun on board in those days. But there used to be air marshals that carried guns. I've never seen one of them. 
anyway, um, so are, are we, who, who are we at war with? Now, the President uh, Bush uh, insists on going back to Washington that night. Uh, he, he says that uh, we're at war with something. We're not really sure what it is. And uh, then he says something that he foreshadows for his congressional address. He says, in this war on terror, you are either with us or against us. So he's a born again Christian, God bless him. A born again Christian from Texas. And he's, he's, uh, uh, he's connecting with the Bible, you know, either with us or against us. Well, who, who, who are we against? And once you decide who you're against, what are you going to do? Now, there were two approaches you could have used on 9-11 plus one. You could have said, there's been a crime. Crimes in the United States perpetrated by foreign visitors, foreigners. So what you do is you put a big yellow tape around 9-11, the Pentagon, Shanksville, you know, and, and you start to use your law enforcement, your FBI, the world's Interpol and FBI everywhere around. And, and you make it a crime, uh, a crime in which you're going to use all the law enforcement at your tool. Does this work? Yes. When the uh, the, the uh, Libyans took down the, uh, the Pan Am flight over Lockerbie, it took years and years of police work around the world to get these guys. And finally got them. Uh, some poor bastard was sentenced to life jail. <laughs> he took them out for Gaddafi, et cetera. But, you know, it's a great crime. So. What, what the president does is, is he, he takes Americans' outrage. Now, uh, America has been involved in a lot of um, secret interventions since 1945. You know. They're not bashful about getting involved, whether it's Nicaragua or Vietnam. And so there's no squeamishness about getting involved. But when the enemy or somebody comes to your door, you think, well, is this a different story? And what do we have to do? So we have to layer up. We have to give all kinds of people who don't know what they're doing because they're not trained for this. They're just, most of the people on 9-11 were simply given another portfolio. Here I am, you know, I'm now in charge of this. And so that we, we, we give a lot of people over the, the next couple of years authority to do things they would never have dreamed of doing. Invading the privacy of America, the FISA courts, tapping things. Uh, and Americans started to imagine there's a syndrome after uh, uh, the, I think it was after the Bader Meinhof gang was successful. A terrorist had always existed in the 70s and 80s. We had the Bader Meinhof gang in West Germany, and the Red Brigade in Italy, Tupereros in Paraguay, the Red Shining Light in Peru, and et cetera. Very successful terrorist groups, but they weren't religiously, they're were politically motivated. They're urban type groups. And, and we started to imagine uh, that uh, we can only get these guys by doing things that we can't do normally in peacetime. Now, with the Red Brigade, psychologists came up with um, a phrase of the Red Brigade, I'm sorry, the uh, the Bader Meinhof gang syndrome. And the syndrome is, is that you start to imagine every threat, you start to imagine threats against you that are very similar to the threats on 9 11. So whether it's coming from, it's going to take place in Madrid or London, Nice or whatever. So you start to imagine it's all part of one package. And um, by now you're funding people, you're giving people authority. And then when you finally get your hands on a terrorist, since you can't torture them in America, that's against the law, you take them to a black site somewhere and you have the Egyptians beat the shit out of them to within an inch of his life, or you interrogate them in some desert someplace, and then you justify what you're doing. My favorite story about entrepreneurs is during this period about how to deal with these the enemy. A couple of 
you know, slick willies, conned the Defense Department into a series of techniques, which they literally said they invented. And one of them was an enhanced interrogation, okay? Put people in a small coffin-like space or whatever. One of them was water torture. Make someone suffocate until they think they're drowning, and then you punch them in the stomach and you start all over again. Actually, uh, this, the Defense Department is so stupid. If they'd have looked in their records, they'd have found out that there were at least 20 Americans who killed Filipino rebels in 1898-1900 using the same technique, the water torture. Mm. You know, putting their head behind a helmet and pouring water down there. It, the technique, technique's been around forever. So these guys, um, they say they have a regime that can do this. You know, the 10 techniques that uh, are uh, invasive but are not going to hurt anybody. And we've all heard that before. And they take them to black sites where they're off of American soil. Imagine torturing someone off American soil. And you got American torturers who convince themselves that it's okay because it's not on American soil. I mean, now we're talking this is weird stuff. This is weird stuff. And so this costs eighty million dollars to introduce this technique. And then one day we wake up and we see these horrible images out of Great Prison of these kids who are torturing terrorists or maybe terrorists. Who knows? And when I think about you know the, the people the the suspects they had, I think about what happened a couple of days ago. You know, the, the, the American top general in Afghanistan says, you know, we, we hit a target in Afghanistan. We got uh, a guy who was going to do us harm. And it turns out to be the guy who delivers water and his, his 10 kids. Uh, and it turns out the only reason they thought he was a bad guy is because he had stopped at his boss's house to collect his computer, the boss's computer. And the boss's house was considered a safe haven for ISIS. And so they, they confused the guy collecting water and delivering food for an American NGO with the bad guy. And so, you know, you start killing all these people. Now, I'm going to say something I don't normally say on air. Americans suffer under 3,000 deaths a day. And, and, and why these people wanted to bring down the Trade Center beats the hell out of me, except they tried to do it in, um, in 1993. Okay, they wanted to blow up the Trade Center. It was a symbol of American capitalism. Uh, one of these uh, imams uh, planted about five tons of bomb in the basement. And because it was in the basement, it didn't take down the building. So they became fixated on it. To me, they wanted to destroy the soul of the New Yorkers. You'd go for the Empire State Building, or the Chrysler Building, something like the Trade Center. You know, it was built in the early 70s. It doesn't mean anything to me. Anyway, the thing that gets me is, is we're, we, we keep making up the rules and justifying ourselves. And the whole time, the government of the day is taking advantage of America's Feeling for revenge. I say three million or three thousand Americans died. I mean, during the Vietnam War, which is my cutting edge of that in my lifetime. Uh, American power put two million innocent Vietnamese into an early grave as collateral damage. No one's got a problem with that. And the North, and I've been to Vietnam since then. And they, they, they don't forget, but they forgive. But Americans after 9/11, they weren't a forgiving group. Okay, but there were two options. You could call it a law enforcement issue and bring in all the world's police to get these guys, or you can do what what President Bush did. He was able to learn through his intelligence that the possible, the probable perpetrator was resident or domiciled in Afghanistan, which is a good place for Bin Laden. He arrived there when he was twenty three. In 1980, when the Mujahideen rose up against the Soviet occupation and the defense of the conference leader there. So he had a lot of practice. That's he had a lot of context there. And so they put the pressure on the, the Afghan government, which is now controlled by another extremist organization called the Taliban. But the Taliban don't have a beef with anybody. They're not going anywhere to destroy you. They're, they're there. That's, that's their turf. 
they, they represent their own roots. Um, and Bin Laden wanted to hurt people who weren't just non-Muslim. You know, this idea, most Muslims don't want to kill infidels. Well, there have been a lot of Christians who wanted to kill infidels in the, in the Crusades. You know, it's not like this is new. This is a new movie. We've seen this movie before. Mm. And, and, and we've seen Christians slaughter each other. We've seen this movie. But the point is, the uh, Bin Laden wanted to hurt the Americans for what he saw were their, their sins of aggression. What do I mean by that? Before we disgorged in the first Gulf War, before we disgorged Saddam Hussein's troops from Kuwait, Americans positioned themselves in Saudi Arabia, which is the home of Mecca and Medina. It's the Holy Land. What are these infidels doing on, on, on holy soil? And that just couldn't get this out of, uh, out of Bin Laden's head. You know, this was a violation of everything. It should not be here on, on, on Saudi soil. And, and, and and he, he saw something else that bothered him too. And that was in 1993, the Americans had gone into Somalia and tried to rescue some people. And one of the Blackhawks was shot down in that service of that mission. And the pilot was uh, beaten to death and dragged through the streets of Mogadishu. And Bin Laden saw that, and he saw there was no response. He also saw in 1982, when 249 uh, Marines were blown up in Beirut, that Reagan went home. There was no response. So he reckoned there are limits to American response. And so he didn't see any response to the Marines. He didn't see any response to this American who's being dragged through the streets. Now, I might also mention to your audience, Americans uh, are, are, have a, a, an emotional attachment to death that only the Egyptians have. You know, Egyptians are very fussy about the afterlife and how you got there. Anyway, Americans are obsessed with bodies and bringing them back, and they're obsessed with the dead. Um, in the lifetime of these soldiers and sailors, Americans wouldn't do anything for them. You know, they get starved to death in, in, in San Francisco as a homeless person. They won't forgive them their education debts. You, you can starve in America. It's that kind of place. But when you die for them, there is this kind of an emotional attachment. Like uh, you mentioned Bahala. We're, we're, we're worshiping. I don't know if you've ever been to an American football or baseball game where they, they bring out a flag that's as big as the field. And this thing and singing Star Spangled Banner, and a crowd, you know, a bunch of roughnecks all start getting tears. You know, the Americans are incredibly sentimental about patriotism, which they f- fuse with death. That's what 9 11 was. It mm. became a patriotic response. And there's this great urge to get even. So the president, whose only uh, foreign policy uh, problem up to that time was trying to get an American sailor, American uh, airman, from China, crash landing, Chinese territory. You know, at the time he was dealing with pharmaceutical bills on Congress. He was having a very, very minimal presidential career. And, you know, George W. Bush represented a sort of a lull in the American political experience. You know, they wanted a guy who wasn't too curious about the world. At the New York Times invented the phrase incurious for to describe how stupid he was about the world. He didn't care. You know, he's a Texas politician who was born in uh, Kennebunkport, Maine, and uh, rich people, senators, and his father was a president. And, you know, he, uh, uh, his drinking buddy, he was an alcoholic back in the day, was uh, a famous Australian tennis player whose name I mentioned. They used to go drinking together. And, stuff like that. and so he comes along, and he's kind of president they wanted at the time. You know, no one ever voted for him because there was a crisis coming. So he's got a problem with his hand. He could declare this to be law enforcement and deal with it that way, as we did with Lockerbie. Or 
he could militarize it. So he goes to Congress and he says, first of all, I want authorization, which he had from this day to this. You know, they, they canceled it now finally, but he still has authorization. The president has this enormous authority. And, and so what he says is, uh, we, we've determined that the man who did this, and a lot of this is still on spec, uh, is, is in Afghanistan. And the government of the day there, which are these other Islamist extremists, they're fundamentalists. They don't want to kill you because you've been in Mecca, but Bin Laden did. And uh, he says to these people, he wants them to cough up Bin Laden. And, and they say to cough up Bin Laden would be to, to deny 2,000 years of Arab traditions, hospitality. You can never cough up a house guest. It just cuts across the grain. Mm. You know, if we asked uh, President Putin today to give us back Ed Snowden, who had more secrets than, than Goldilocks, I mean, you know, we, we, these guys, they don't cough them up. And no one's going to go to war with Putin. He's got nuclear weapons. But this guy, uh, they, these people represent sort of a marginal government in a marginal place. What I mean by that is it's a place of hills and mountains and tribes and family connections. And, and, and it's uh, been a killing ground for empires in the past. It's, <clears throat> it's what we call in, in, in America in the 19th century, the Badlands. So you ask the leader of the Badlands to cough up this guy. This guy said, I'm not going to do it. Of course, now, by now, Bin Laden is, is looking for a place to hide. He's probably headed for uh, Pakistan, which is uh, the refuge. Uh, the Taliban and Al Qaeda were used indirectly by the secret police or by the international organization in, in Pakistan as kind of their proxies, you know, in this part of the world. You know, they did things for them. And they provided them with safe cover. I mean, Pakistanis have always played this double game about being a good ally of the West, but at the same time, we're going to look after our own neighborhood. And they're very worried about Afghanistan because they're very worried about India's plans for back in Pakistan. Same thing with the Russians and Chinese. They're all in it together. It's, it's, it's the Balkans. It is a balkanized kind of concept. So they, the sky doesn't want to cough up Bin Laden. So, uh, we, it is America, and about 35 other nations get a UN resolution. Here we come. So this, 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 the, the entire world is able to agree on, on going. And what they're doing is, is they're riffing off of America's determination to go in. America feels that it wants revenge and the, the, the neocons, the neoconservatives within uh, the George Bush administration, Take advantage of America's rawness, feeling of revenge, to revenge, and they say, well, we're going to go in. And so what they did was, in good uh, Texas uh, style, is they they rounded up the posse. And the posse was Australia and Poland and, you know, 35 other nations all well, went charging in. And, and within a very short period of time, the, the Taliban buckled. They're not ready for it. an assault from the Western world, you know, it's, it's not happening. So they, they buckle. And then now we're there. And after a very short period, uh, we decide, uh, well, we, we can't go back. We, we, we can't find Bin Laden, but we can't just leave. And so the UN gets involved in nation building, education for children. Pretty soon, tens of millions of dollars are spent on education for youngsters and young girls and women. Women enter the police force, the judiciary, and all these things that the Taliban will not allow. And the Taliban don't allow anything that Afghan society doesn't allow. These guys are not outliers. They represent these very conservative um, way of doing business. And so we're, we're, we're in a different business here now. And we're also there looking for uh, terrorists. Now, we're starting to imagine there are terrorists everywhere. We have a big budget now for terrorists. Every uh, military organization, every intelligence organization has a terrorist unit. And we're starting to spend a lot of time understanding who becomes a terrorist. We have created a science 
and a budget for determining how extensive these 19, uh, these 19 people are with their box cutting knives. You start to imagine the whole world is filled with these people. And yes, the whole world is filled with these people, but not because George W. Bush says they envy us. I mean, who envies them? <laughs> you know, Bush says this is a read, they, they envy us. What are they talking about? You know? You know, when Bush was elected president, there were seven million Americans who were sleeping on the sidewalk that night. What are they? What are they admiring? Our infrastructure, our homeless, our poor, our you know things that don't work. You know, I, I can't get it. So anyway, the president uses uh, this attack as the reason, not a pretext. He uses it as the reason to get involved in, in Afghanistan. And then I'm just going to turn around a second. I wrote a, a book comparing U.S. involvement in the first Gulf War and the second Gulf War. So one was George W. Bush discouraging um, Iraq from Kuwait. And the second Gulf War is what we, we, we segue into here. And I love this cover here. We're talking about covers earlier. Uh, when they, uh, they asked me if I had any ideas for the cover, I, I was thinking of the old Eddie Murphy, uh, the Eddie Murphy movie. Uh, coming to coming going to America, where the guy in the in the in the hamburger joint says he's got his money, his pictures on the money, he's a real prince. So I said to the, the marketing people in New York, I said, "You got a picture of Saddam Hussein on the money? Let's put it, let's put it on the cover of the book." We finally got a guy, a tyrant whose pictures on the money. I said, "I can't believe our our, our good fortune." Mm-hmm. Anyway. The president has got the whole world on its side and the French are, you know, so we are Americans today and the Australians are in because the Australians are always in. And Australia, you know, uh, has always taken great pride in paying their insurance policy on hands. You know, we're in, never in too much. In fact, uh, when I arrived here in the early 70s, Australians and New Zealanders had a reputation as being Prussians in the Southwest Pacific. If there's a fight, Australia hasn't avoided fights since the Boer War. They, they've been into everything. You know, Australians like to fight. And military people want to bloody each generation so they know how to fight the next time around. You know, it's, it's the military people do. But anyway, the, the, the president, uh, he neutralizes the Taliban who head for the hills. So they're out there for the next 20 years taking pot shots at people. They're, uh, they're perfecting IEDs, these explosive devices that you can't see until your car is up in the air and stuff like this. So they're, they're developing terrorist wars, guerrilla warfare within urban settings. So you get a lot of uh, Americans and Australians and Brits and other people who invent all these counter uh, insurgency, counter terrorist techniques. You know, so soldiers ought to go into Afghan neighborhoods and play with the children and show them they're good guys. It's crazy stuff. You know, <laughs> the, the military is the military. Their job is to, to put down the enemy, not to be police force or peacekeepers. They got people for that in the UN. So the, the, the president uh, has decided to militarize this thing. What is this thing called? Well, we go from the CNN headline, America under attack, to, not a crime, but the war on terror. Well, from that day to this, I ask you to tell me, what the hell is the war on terror? I mean, is it against Boko Haram or Al-Shabaab in Africa? Is it against the Houthis in, in Yemen, the bad guys in Syria? What is this war on terror? Initially, it was to get the box cutters. The chief box cutter is a guy named Bin Laden. Lots of experience. Obviously, the mastermind behind the whole thing. That's one thing. He's the bad guy. Now, there are lots of people like him. And we start to imagine there are because now we have a budget to get them. And we got people whose careers are dedicated to getting them. And we got the CIA telling us over and over again, as they did during the Cold War, you, we can't tell you about all the times we have saved you from disaster. Our victories must be in secret. 
I've heard that story a million times, okay? That they are doing things in secret that are helping us. Actually, they're doing things in secret that are killing us, as a matter of fact. But that's another story. So now we have, we have here what I call an opportunity. So we have this conflict or this, this crime by the 19 box curse. And we are able to neutralize the government that is sheltering them, though it assures the hell don't know what to do with Afghanistan. And now we got some unfinished business. Uh, President Bush is surrounded by planners like Paul Wolfowitz and uh, a guy named Pearl, Dick Pearl. He's surrounded by uh, the Secretary of Defense, Rumsfeld, and the Vice President, Dick Cheney, who have some unfinished business. And the unfinished business was regime, regime change in Iraq. This is something that has been going on since early 1990s. It was picked up by Madeleine Albright and, uh, and President uh, Clinton, that Saddam Hussein would have to go. But Saddam Hussein is not a Islamist extremist. In fact, he's just your garden variety tyrant. He's a dictator. You know, he likes blondes, scotch, Frank Sinatra. And he's got two kids who are crazy, who kill other people at will. He's just crazy. And he's surrounded by crazy people. And... And they try to drag him into this net. Now, Americans are so angry. They're, they're, they're up for any story. And the story is this. Is that Saddam Hussein is developing weapons of mass destruction, probably in uh, collusion with or with the connivance of uh, Islamist extremists. They said it, they started to make, uh, they start to invent connections between him and bin Laden. If he got his hands on bin Laden, He'd have had him stoned to death. He doesn't want bill. He doesn't want that kind of thing. You know, in the 1980s, he was receiving aid and visits from the American government about how to take on the Iranians. He was just a player. He was a bit player in the Cold War. Mm. And the idea that he's harboring extremism. And, and so Americans aren't going to buy that story because it's pretty hard to fit. So what they say is that he's renewed his dreams from the 1990s. That he's returning to the idea of uh, developing weapons of mass destruction that is nuclear weapons. So there's all these stories invented around the world that uh, tube alloy is coming from Africa, this thing, that thing. And there are all kinds of people who, who are giving, uh, who are spying on Saddam, who, who claim to know that they have weapons of mass destruction. It is a bold-faced lie from the beginning until the end. Now, the, the problem is this. While it is a lie, it is legal. The president of the United States has the authorization to attack anybody he wants and then inform Congress later on under the war. He, he's completely legal to do what he's doing, particularly if he can, continues to utter the lie over and over again. They have weapons of mass destruction and WMDs. And I knew this was not true because I'm a, I'm a world expert on weapons of mass destruction. And there was no way on God's green earth that that guy could have assembled a team, nor less deliver weapons of mass destruction on anybody. Now, the story is he can develop a small nuclear weapon and the terrorists will take it and they'll drop it on us or they'll put it on a boat or something like that. In those days, they were not, uh, the terrorists were going to get a small nuclear weapon and they were going to secrete it to Canada and then drive it across the Canadian border near Niagara or Detroit. You know, all kinds of ways. So we started scaring ourselves to death. But we allowed the president to perpetuate this. And we, we had some help on this. Um, uh, Tony Blair fell in. Uh, to, to this day, I don't know why Tony Blair fell in on this, but he's a smart guy. Uh, he, he backed the president. And then uh, the president wanted to do what his dad did was he wanted to invade uh, Iraq on a UN resolution. 
because the UN already had resolutions that Saddam Hussein was not to do this and not to do that, and not to trade in these areas, he's not to receive nuclear parts. And everybody cheated and got around his, uh, uh, they got around the rules, including the, uh, the Wheat Commission here in Australia that uh, cheated to, to, to get around all the rules of trading. Everybody was cheating to do business with him because he was big business. And he doesn't have these weapons of mass destruction. And he's not able to convince, uh, that has to be the argument in the UN. So in my book, I, I look at the, the UN fight both times. It's dead. And so first time is easy because the uh, Iraqis are sitting in Kuwait. <laughs> they're there. I don't care why they're there. You know, even, they might even have justification for being there. Because why? The Kuwaitis screwed them on their bills. They didn't pay their bills. That's simple. That's simple. Mm. And, um, but the second time, the UN is insisting, including the Chinese, uh, the Chinese uh, representative and the uh, French representative, Russian representative, who are all acting responsibly. You know, when, when these nations get involved in the UN Security Council, they really become different people. You know, they represent some larger principles in themselves. And they're not believing the whole story. They want to send out more teams. And, and the president's and people are saying, look, we've already investigated all we can investigate. There's nothing more to investigate. We have to move in before things get dangerous. So uh, a little more than a year after 9-11, year and a half, we're involved in a war with Iraq with very few allies, save again the Poles and the Australians, very few allies. Um, the UN's not giving us any backing here. There's going to be no carte blanche. And the UN's very, um, very good for Americans. You know, it allowed, um, it allowed Harry S. Truman to get involved in Korea in 1950 without a declaration of war. You know, he's leading the UN troops and stuff like that. Same thing with George W. Bush. He's able to get the imprimatur of the United Nations, a George H.W. Bush. But George W. Bush can't get the imprimatur. And, and, and the French are, are, are very clear, though they did lie. You know, we're talking about French diplomacy these days. They did lie. They said, you know, when your Air Force goes in, our Air Force is going to go with you. And then they withdrew that. And then the, the French, and when the UN Security Council becomes very serious, the state, the Secretary of State, and the foreign foreign uh, foreign ministers of these countries actually sit down in that same place. And the, the French foreign minister tells uh, the Americans, "You don't know what you're doing in that part of the world. This is the land of Alibaba and the ancient uh, uh, the Arabian Nights. You, you don't know what you're doing." Now, I'm a big believer in this. I think our problem in Vietnam was uh, cultural blindness. We got involved in a place about which not only did we not know what we were doing, but up until the day we left, we didn't know what we were doing wrong. So, so we didn't know about rice culture, village life, or Buddhism, okay? Same, same thing with the French are trying to say to this guy, hey, this is a different game. You know, once you break this guy, what are you going to replace him with? And, and we're now playing a very dangerous game. So we've gone from the 19 box cutters to a war and nation building in Afghanistan. And then in 2003, we're, we're, we're up against a, a war, a possible war in Iraq. Now, why, why didn't Saddam Hussein admit he didn't have nuclear? Well, for two reasons. Number one, he didn't want to tell the Iranians, who's his ancient enemy, he doesn't have nuclear weapons. He wants to keep them at bay. And number two, he didn't believe the Americans would do anything about it because he saw what they did when that body was dragged through uh, Somalia. He saw that they didn't do anything. And he, he gives them credit. He gave them credit for what happened in Kuwait. He understood how that, that happened. But he didn't think they'd move on it based on this kind of thin evidence. The evidence, as the evidence gets thinner and thinner, the administration has to do something. It now has tens of thousands of troops in the Saudi desert waiting to go into Iraq. Now they're taking their shots. They're in the sun. 
You can't keep an army of a half a million men in the desert. And of course, Bin Laden is in the hills in Pakistan going crazy. This is what he, he hates, is these uh, infidels on, on Saudi soil, on, on soil of Mecca and Medina. This is, this is what fuels his campaign. So Saddam, he gambles that the Americans won't do anything. Well, we all remember the night you know, we saw on CNN the bombs hitting uh, uh, Baghdad and all that. And within a couple of days, I saw on CNN that American troops had made it to the Euphrates River. I'm thinking to myself, what would Thomas Jefferson have to say, or George Washington would have to say about an American expeditionary force camped on the banks of the Euphrates River? I mean, this is so un-American to get involved in this this neck of the woods. It is so stupid and it's so self-defeating because there is nothing there we can do for these people. American democracy, like Guinness beer, does not travel. It can't bring it somewhere else. It doesn't fix onto a place. They thought it would work in Afghanistan. Well, very poor roots. They thought it would work in, in, in Iraq. Now, we defeat uh, Saddam Hussein in a very short period of time. And all these intelligence geniuses says that, say that the uh, Iraqi people will greet the Americans as liberators. Well, we've heard that story before. That was supposed to happen in the Bay of Pigs in 1961. And it was supposed to happen again. Even you know, the, the, the Viet Cong, thought, the North Vietnamese thought the lunar uprising would be uh, uh, met, met by uh, would, met, would be met by the South Vietnamese people. They'd be met by as liberators. So that, you know, a lot of people get this wrong. They start to believe their own stuff. So we're we're in our run, and we have a number of people who delivered on the promise. Uh, Chang, Secretary of Defense, Senate Vice President. Vice President Cheney, uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, and uh, now Paul Wolfowitz and others. They're, they're, they're there, uh, along with others we appoint. And we're starting to uh, invite now private contractors to do a lot of the work that the military doesn't, can't do. And one of the American planners decides, just as they did in Nazi Germany after the war, you know, to make sure that Good Nazis weren't in the Wehrmacht after the war, you know, reconstituted uh, defense force. They, they targeted Saddam Hussein's religious uh, conspirators. That is, they dissolved the army, which was top heavy with Sunnis to grant other places. This was an opportunity for the Shia, who are, as you know, mostly related to the Iranians, to go in high places. Well, how can you build up a, a stable Iraq if you're going to dissolve the army, which is the only thing that held a damn thing together anyway? And, and so we're starting to get some people who've got some very wrong ideas. And then we, we start to arrest all kinds of people among the Sunnis, and we put them in prison for their acts of defiance or whatever. And then in prison, they all get to meet each other again. And they got an idea. The idea is let's break out of here and we can become ISIS and we can turn this whole place into a caliphate, which is the whole idea. And so we, we not only defeated uh, Saddam, but we, we prepared the ground for this ISIS rebellion which then took years to. Now, now we're talking about between 9-11 and, you know, yesterday, these wars cost between three and four hundred million dollars a day, you know, six, seven, eight trillion. Nine hundred thousand lives lost everywhere. I'm not going to blame the Americans for all this. A lot of people managed to get themselves killed anyway. And, and, and so the, these wars uh, all have Unintended consequences. That is the, and of course, every time you kill nine hundred thousand people, you prevented maybe three million people from living their lives. You know, they're not going to 
become citizens and not going to become fathers or mothers and not going to become poets or writers and not going to become tradesmen. Nothing. They're nothing. Nothing can happen. They are stuck in a war economy that doesn't work. And so you get all the lives that are canceled out. So you get all these people who are canceled out. And what are they going to do about it? Well, they might join an organization that, that gets even. I think this feeling of love, the flip side is revenge. And I think revenge covers a lot of, gives people energy. You know, like, um, they're just not in the mood to do anything. Now, here you have the United States and in in Afghanistan and all the other civilized nations get involved. Second time around, a couple of years later, we're now, or a year and a half later, we're now involved in Afghanistan. We're broken down society to rebuild it. And it's not being rebuilt very well. It's not working. So a lot of people who had been uh, massacred in the north, uh, I'm sure they're quite happy that there's some forces there. Because um, the old north and south fly zones to protect the minorities, they were working really well. And Saddam did use poison gas. He could be a monster. But he didn't have any nuclear weapons or biological or chemical weapons. So he didn't have weapons of mass destruction. And we were able to prove that uh, after we defeated him. You know, and, and Iraq's the size of California. Man. If you want to hide nuclear weapons somewhere, you can do it. As a matter of fact. So we, we, we've got this place and we're not sure what to do about it. And, and you know, with, with, with your shows, I always like to tie up things with antiquity. And, and the United States was never a superpower. That's a little story people tell. Or a unipower. Uh, uh, or a hyperpower. I mean, hyperpowers don't lose wars to the North Koreans. They don't lose wars to the Vietnamese. This is ridiculous. The United States is a, is a great power. And in Iraq and in Afghanistan, the United States acted like a great power that Thucydides could have written about 2,500 years ago. The United States did what it could do because it could. And Afghanistan and Iraq did what it had to do because it couldn't resist. So the weak do what they will. I'm sorry, the strong do what they will and the weak do what they must. This is the classic alien dialogue played out on the live screen because America is in a position to do it. Mm -hmm. And we have a number of people who are steering the ship of state. They're saying that we have unfinished business. We should have finished up uh, Saddam Hussein in the 1990s. And so they use the, the hurt or the, 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 the revenge of, of 9-11 to attack Iraq. Now, I put it to you. Are the 19 box cutters who are committed to these acts on the day? And these acts are confined to New York, Washington, and Pennsylvania. Is this the war on terror? I mean, are they coming for us? And so what America does with all this legislation, all these things it can do like an enhanced terror nation and invading into the privacy of the individual using these FISA rights, that is, these court orders to get onto your phone, internet, things like that. They, they get it to create a, an America under siege, siege mentality, and, and to do what they want to do. And that, that has to erode individual rights. And it's all done in the name of the war on terror, which is invented for the 19 box cutters. This thing is out of proportion. You don't have to go to war with two nations to get 19 box cutters. And then when you get a couple of the box cutters, they, they've been in uh, uh, Guantanamo prison there 10, 15 years on a trial yet because you don't know what to do with them. You can't put them on American soil because the American Congress says no terrorists are shown under American soil. So you can't get the terrorist who's killing you and put them on American soil on trial. You got to put them somewhere else for a neutral trial. Where are they going to get a neutral trial? Nowhere. So the windup is you got this very expensive prison holding these people. And, and so we're, we're involved in all these wars and in nation building based on a crime committed by 19 people who were connected by, you know, 
the Lion's using Saudi money and he's using um, donations or charities around the world, kind of thing. And he becomes a lightning rod to uh, people who want to do what he's doing. And, you know, uh, the Taliban and bin Laden regard non-followers uh, as infidels. Uh, the, but Taliban's not going to fo- follow you home to Sydney or me to Chicago. They're going to make sure, they just want to make sure you're, you're not there. It's about turf. But bin Laden, it looks like he's committed to finding you wherever you are. So everybody starts to imagine. And I, I just uh, I just love it when people say, you know, this is brand new. Uh, what's the threat to us right now? And of course, it, it's, it's not brand new. Terrorism has been around a long time. Islamic extremism has been around a long time. These guys went after a building they went after in 1993. That's how important it was to them. And they represent people who blew up the USS Cole, who blew up those American embassies in uh, Tanzania and whatever else. These are people who are committed to expelling the infidel from that part of the world. It's not because they envy anybody, you know. And and, and when you're on somebody's soil, uh, you're playing a different kind of a game, game because there are people who wouldn't hurt a fly. But if you're standing on their soil, you become the enemy. You know, the, the end of the Vietnam War, they wanted everybody to get the hell out of there. It wasn't the case, even though the South Vietnamese suffered terribly as a result. And so, yeah, you, you can't take over these countries without foot soldiers. You know, you, you can, air power alone doesn't do it, so you need foot soldiers. And so, how long are you going to stay in one place? Well, as long as the public will put up with it, as a matter of fact. Now, This war on terror looks really easy today because easy to talk about because it's got a beginning for most people, and it has a close. The other, day, the other bookend is the fall of Kabul and the end of the war in Afghanistan. And President Biden says um, he wanted to eliminate this forever war so that he could pivot to the Pacific, now called the Indo-Pacific, for reasons. Uh, for another day. And, and and he wants to get out of these forever wars. Well, no one ever called them forever. There are two kinds of wars. There's a war of necessity. That's when uh, the Japanese attack you on Pearl Harbor, or they attack the, the uh, Australian British troops in Singapore. It is when you're attacked. And, and number two, there's a war of choice. There's no forever war. It's just war. You choose to go to war because you have an option. You know, there was a a, a sign on Secretary of State Paul's desk in the State Department where he says, restraint is strength. Restraint is strength. You know, there is a time to go to war and there's a time not to go to war. And there's a time to emphasize diplomacy. And, you know, the only guy in the world who was predicting the resurgence of religion as a major issue was uh, Tony Blair. He knew that religion counted for a lot of the world. You know, half the world brags about not believing. And the other half is committed to something. There's a maker. And he, he, he you know, the, the fundamentalism among the is, is, is Islam is, is, to me, the equivalent of the fundamentalists among Christians. You know, evangelicals today uh, represent one quarter of the American vote. When the hell did they become a quarter of the It's because they got galvanized. You know, and and they are, they are determined to bring their vision of the world to the world, and and I got I got a buddy who does nuclear work with me. So he's always worried about evangelicals like Mike Pompeo and others in high places because they're not worried about the day of reckoning. You know, revelation for them is around the corner. They don't care. Yeah. If, you know, most, most people involved in nuclear decisions actually care about deterring things for them. That's the whole idea. But these people, they, they, they can't wait for the coming. And I'm thinking, well, it's a different, it's a different approach. He said, it, 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 what it means is there's a little less restraint about pushing people around. 
So we got a war that costs a lot of money. Not to say that all this, these billions and trillions of dollars would have been spent on social justice and social needs. People, that's not a choice for most people. So we got a war that's cost trillions of dollars, destroyed a million lives, and produced, by the way, worldwide exodus of refugees. Now this thing just keeps bouncing. The ripple effects. It's created worldwide uh, consternation. And and today, you know, we got countries that are impoverished. You know, uh, months ago they talked about the coming crisis in Yemen. Well, we don't even hear about that anymore. The crisis is so bad. Today, uh, one in three Afghans go to bed goes to bed hungry. So we got starvation. We got deprivation everywhere in these parts of the world, and and I'm not going to say it was better before we got there, but it couldn't have been any worse before we got there. And so I'm just for this audience, I want to say that the war on terror, for all the money spent, for all the lives lost, has accomplished nothing except a burning, a mass casualty assault on American soil. The the great thing, indeed, the positive thing America did after Vietnam, I'm sorry, it was after 9-11, was to harden America's borders. Air travel now is so unpleasant that not even the terrorists can get through. It is, it, American borders are impenetrable between electro, electronic recognition and databases. Mm. Uh, it is you know, when, when these people brag and the intelligence people, we haven't had a mass casualty on American soil from that day to this. You're absolutely right. And that is all two wars, a million casualties, and seven, eight trillion dollars by a ship is you don't have another mass casualty attack. Could you have had that without two wars? Oh yeah. Could have done the same thing without selling people a whole bill of goods. Could have been, you know, I, I think it's cruel to go to a place like Afghanistan and invite women and girls to get an education and youngsters to grow up to become cricket players and the like. And then you leave them to return to a seventh century version of Sharia law. This is cruel. This is cruelty that I think matches things in the Middle Ages. This is just turning your back. You know, when uh, America has crocodile tears for the Uyghurs in Western China or Alexei Navalny rotting in prison somewhere, and you, you turn your back on 10 million girls and women and hundreds of thousands of people who work with you. And then you say, we're done with that place. And then you, you say, What's their fault? No, their armed forces wouldn't fight, which isn't true. The armed forces had been told the Americans were leaving. And when the Americans left with their 2,500 men, they took their 18,000 contractors who kept the planes in the sky. And they took their uh, 5,000, the, the NATO troops, another 5,000, decided to leave because they weren't going to stay there if the Americans were going to stay there. So the Afghans had two choices. They could fight to the last bullet, or they could just drop their arms. And so, in a way, we forced that decision. But to say on national television that the Afghans are cowards, they didn't fight. Whoa. See, that doesn't make any sense to me. You know, we, we left them in the lurch. Now, um, one of the real lessons of Vietnam, I'm sorry, real lessons, I want to say Vietnam because that's my disaster. When I was yeah. but one of the real lessons of war on terrorists. Uh, a number of people have now see America as less reliable as, a, as an ally. Now, I said after the fall of Kabul that this shows me that NATO is dead. It's an organization that lasted 70 years. It's outlived its usefulness. The NATO people say, hey, America is left without telling us. How can we trust them? Bingo! How can you trust them? America responds to its own national interests. When Americans got involved in Vietnam, it didn't 
prep the Australian decision. When it left Vietnam, it didn't tell anyone Australia first. When we abandoned the Taiwanese in 1979 to make way for China and the United Nations, we didn't ask anybody's permission. When we abandoned the Vietnamese in April 1975 to their own fate, we didn't ask anybody's permission. We were just going, you know? And, and, and so, I mean, when we abandoned uh, the Hungarians to the revolt in 56 after encouraging them to rise up against Soviet tanks, we didn't care. Nothing we can do about it. And, and, and same thing with the Iranians. You know, we support the Shah and all the forces fighting the Ayatollah. And when push comes to shove, we're gone. We're not helping anybody. And so these people then respond. And, and nations do what they have to do. I want to say this for your audience that's actually current with news. You know, the French are jumping all up and down because of this new alliance with Australia and Britain about nuclear submarines. And it's not really alliance because the alliance is a treaty and this ain't a treaty at all. This something else. And nations do what they think they have to do. There are about 195, maybe 200 nations. And they all do what they have to do to survive. Because smaller ones know that if they don't survive, they will disappear. You know, lots of smart people disappear. You know, in 38, the Czechs saw that they were dealt away by the Western world by the, with the Nazis and, and even the Bolsheviks can see that the West didn't give a damn about checks because they didn't ask them to come to the party. And so people do that. And, and you know, in, in the Second World War, the French uh, surrendered after 23 days and then they they were occupied by the Nazis and then they, co- they, they collaborated with the Nazis. And when, and when the Nazis were finally driven out in, in 1945, the good French took over 100,000 French citizens into the street and slaughtered them for collaborating with the, the Nazis, whether it was the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, or the girl around the corner. They slaughtered them in the streets as examples of collaborators. So, you know, when the French cry crocodile tears today about not doing the right thing, we all look the other way, but we just, we just couldn't look at it, so we ignored it. And, and, and so when people start holding each other to historical standards, they're in the wrong game because in, in the world of nations, nations act for today and tomorrow. I don't care about this. So when I hear about deals are being made because we have shed blood together for a hundred years as comrades in arms, that means nothing to me. To drag up the dead into these lousy decisions. Is, is, is almost obscene, as a matter of fact. So anyway, I, I want your audience to think about this war on terror, which begins technically on 9-11, perpetrated by 19 uh, Islamic extremists, guys who took over airplanes with box cutters, to the fall of Kabul, and we're now leaving Afghanistan, it's 38 million people, to the tender ministries of the Taliban, um, they'll survive. A lot of people will die. But there's not much we can do about it. And I, I think we ought to be very modest about what we think we can do about it. And, and well, this raises the role. About what, what role does the United States play? During the First World War, when, when Woodrow Wilson broke uh, uh, 150 years of policy, Getting into the First World War is the first foreign war America got into since 1800, okay? And, and America's policy was not only non-intervention, except when it was collecting debts from Central America, but it was, it was no political entanglements. And so there is no American security treaty in peacetime between 1800, when we told the French to wreck off, to NATO. No commitments. And then Woodrow Wilson comes along and says, uh, he gets involved in the First World War, gets involved in the League of Nations, collective security. He binds America up with this, only to be rejected twice by the Senate. The Senate rejected the treaty. And so he leaves office in disgrace, you know, didn't work out. And um, so Americans didn't want to get involved. And, you know, I, I've always thought as a, 
historian of American diplomacy, that Americans are torn between reforming the world and staying home. You know, there's a, two versions. There's a, a wonderful cartoon I saw of Garfield the Capitals. Garfield's on a chair. A little bubble comes up over his head. It says, I think I'm going to go for a run. And then in the next caption, the bubble says, it's past. So he continues to sit in the chair. You know, I always thought the question is not about the reliability of America as a partner. But can America stay home? Can you be attacked on Australian or American soil or British soil without going to war with half of the Middle East? I mean, this in, in retrospect, it looks mad to have done what we've done. But people have to understand the American people were wounded. And President Bush, through his advisors who had unfinished business, decided to take care of business, unfinished business. Unfinished business was Saddam Hussein and regime change. What are they going to replace him with? They don't have a hunch who they're going to replace him with. Are they going to get rid of this guy? He's bad news. Now, the the thing is, you actually have the ability to do these kinds of things. Now, the people working around George W. Bush were little, this is now 2002, early 2003. They were in Washington in... 1991, when the Moscow dominated communism and it finished, that's when the flag came down from the Kremlin. That was the defeat of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union disappeared, replaced by a federation of Russian states. And George H.W. Bush told his Washington establishment not to brag about this because it really had nothing to do with America. The, the end of the Cold War was the implosion of Soviet Russia. Now, I've written some good books with one of America's great scholars on the Cold War, Norman Gribner. I wrote books for him, with him, in my 60s when he was in his, not in my early 70s, 60s, late 60s, when he was in his late 80s and 90s, plus his brilliant student. He was about 80. So we've written these books in the Cold War and revisiting the Iraq War. And we discovered a very interesting thing. That Reagan and Gorbachev ended the Cold War by ending the nuclear arms race. The Cold War had morphed from the political ideological struggle of 1945 to a nuclear arms race. What they did was decided to calm down because nuclear Reagan's coming out as a born again Christian. He, he finally discovers one day, uh, against all the conservatives who got him into government and were surrounding him, a lot of people who were very angry with him who went on to work for the other guy, for George W. Bush later on. Reagan wakes up one day and he says, How can we use, how can we threaten to use nuclear weapons against a nation to stop them from using nuclear weapons? There's a threat of nuclear weapons. Make us as bad as they are. And his answer is yes. That's why he spent all of his, his, his extra money and time on SDI, that was somebody neutralized incoming uh, bombs, which he was going to share with the enemy. So you can't deter nuclear war by threatening nuclear war. Now, his revelation comes through Caspar Weinberger, uh, a Catholic guy who began life as a, a Presbyterian, who's, who's working very closely with the uh, Catholic bishops. This is the essence of their newsletter. You can't do this. It's it's immoral. And, and Reagan, you know, he's a simple fellow, but he understands morality. And so one day, Gorbachev comes along, and Gorbachev is a hard member of the Communist Party. He's general secretary of the Communist Party and uh, the premier, okay? And he, he sees that the Soviet economy isn't working very well. And, and that the military is taking too much money. 
You know, the militaries in these countries don't announce how much money they're really taking. There are all kinds of black items in Congress. And he reckoned that the military was taking 22% of every ruble spent in government. In America, it was about 10%. And, you know, the, I point out, and other people point out, that between 1941, the Manhattan Project, until 1991, the third highest expenditure in American life are nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons research. Only behind salaries, federal salaries, and social security. Imagine that. Third highest item in America. And, and Reagan wanted to do something about that. And that was the problem that, that Gorbachev was having. So Gorbachev says to Reagan, I don't think you're going to attack me anyway. And let's just call off the arms race. And at one stage, they came that close to calling off uh, to destroy all nuclear weapons. And uh, they held back on that because Reagan didn't want to give him SDI, the, the Strategic Defense Initiative, which he thought was the fail safe. Now, of course, SDI was never going to work. It could always open. It. Oh, yeah. Maybe he, he held out too long on this. And it's interesting, the Strategic Defense Initiative was Ed Teller's idea. Ed Teller was the uh, father of the hydro, hydro, hydrogen bomb. He also worked with the Manhattan Project. Keep in mind, the American... Uh, military establishment, the, the, the scientists and the physicists uh, have experienced three blank checks in their lifetime. So the Manhattan Project has no limits. The thermonuclear weapon after 1950 has no limits. And then SDI has no limits. You know, some of these people are on a gravy train and they're committed scientists. You know, scientists they don't care what policy is. They're the scientists. So today when I hear about scientists telling us all about policy, I think, yeah, you got this backwards, fellas. You give that information to the policy people who are elected or are in control, you know. I'm not interested in what you have to say about it. So anyway, um, Gorbachev has an idea for the Soviet economy. While serving as a, a very conservative general secretary, that's how you get elected, <coughs> he decides it is personally going to restore the economy through openness and uh, fairness. It's perestroika and bus mess. And so he institutes a number of reforms. Now, when I pointed out in my three-volume work with Professor Grigner and Professor Parts, is that the end of the Cold War was a decision taken by Gorbachev and Reagan. Let me give Gorbachev high marks for this. And end of the Cold War. The, the end of the Soviet Union was the unintended consequence of Gorbachev's reforms. The Soviet Union came down on its own. They're not connected. But after the war, after the Cold War, there were a number of neocons who said that they had spent the Soviet Union into bankruptcy, which is not true. The day the Soviet flag came down, the Soviet Union had no less than 40,000 strategic nuclear weapons. There was no weakness. And I've been among Russian refugees at conferences in Europe where they blame the Americans for the end of the Cold War, for the end of the Soviet Union. I point out to them, hey, you got this mixed up. You guys are the end of the Soviet Union. You brought it down. The end of the Cold War is about the arms race. So a lot of these people imagine that America had a superior product. They imagine they were supreme. These are the unipolars, the hyperpolar people. These are the people who thought they could do things. This is the military, the foreign military establishment in Washington. They thought they could take this, uh, this momentum from the Cold War, which they assumed they're responsible for, which they weren't, and bring it into the Middle East and change things. Now, they, they never understood how incompatible the American spirit was. You know, as a, a famous historian says in the 1950s at the University of Chicago, uh, American democracy is attached to the land. There's only certain things that work in certain places. You just can't bring it somewhere. Like the young lady who talked about Guinness, Guinness beer. It doesn't travel. So these people thought they could change things. They thought they were in control. And, and when, when these people today sit back and complain about things, 
I'd like to flog them in public for getting us there in the first place. And had George Bush coming along and saying, look, there's a lot of immoderate discussion right now and, and you know, excessive talk. You know, he either lied or he was dumb as a bag of doorknobs to believe their stories. They all wanted to take that momentum from the Cold War and bring it forward. This is that arrogance. Once again, you'll find it all over uh, antiquity. This is hubris. We, we did it here. We can make it work here. Well, actually, you didn't do it here, and it ain't going to work there. If you knew anything about cultural history or cultural blindness, you know, when, when you have to invade a war without knowing the language, you're already in trouble, as far as I'm concerned. You're already in trouble. Then you you need an army of 20,000 interpreters and translators, half of whom are working for the other side to the cinema. You got, you got that. So we took that, that, that arrogance that came from the belief that they had won the Cold War. They waited for their moment to remove Saddam Hussein after 1990 because they're on a roll, you know, you you get rid of uh, Saddam Hussein, and then you get rid of the Soviet Union. What the hell? You can you can you can clean the table up. You know you you, just, you get all you get all the balls off the table. This is perfect. So the the Middle East comes up, and they got all these great ideas. And uh, there is a, a saying in Washington: these military industrial these these the foreign military foreign military establishment, the foreign affairs establishment consists of the Council of Foreign Affairs, Brookings, the Rand Corporation, all these. Really bright men and women sit around. Imagine they could change the world. And uh, all I can say is you don't get your money much on think tanks, you know, they funded by this person, this group, et cetera, et cetera. And they got all these bright ideas. And when they're when they fail, whether it's Vietnam or Tehran or Taiwan or some other place. They then become invisible for a moment before they try it again. And in Washington, they poke fun at this group, people like me. They call them the blob from the uh, uh, from the movie called The Blob, that it just yeah. <laughs> reconstitutes itself. It's a terrible movie, but the blob is exciting. You know, it's this green mush that comes through the movie theater doors. They call them the blob because they don't know when they're defeated. They just reconstitute themselves for the next administration. <laughs> and there are always the people saying, well, we should have a residual force in Afghanistan because, you know, it's time to leave the war. Just, they're always looking for ways to create American platforms around. Them. And uh, I get a kick out of the, when we left Afghanistan. I mean, you know, you don't give up your main Air Force base to defend the commercial Air Force base. When you're not in control of the streets anymore. This is just stupid. These are just stupid people. And then they get on television and they tell you this is the greatest airlift since the Berlin blockade. Uh, actually, I can see all these dead people. You know, I was on a, a show sign with, uh, with, uh, in, uh, I, I do a show in Beijing every couple of weeks. God knows why they ask me. No friend of the Communist Party, but and I talk about foreign affairs from the Western viewpoint. We're talking about the fall of Kabul, and I'm on the pla- I'm on the panel with a professor from the University of Tehran, who's a very angry and silly person, and he's on air with me, and he's saying that uh, Biden and his people have covered up the what happened that day when they, there was an attack on those people. It wasn't ISIS. It was American soldiers who panicked and fired into the into the crowd and killed two hundred people. And he said it like he was talking about the afternoon sun coming down. You know, he he just said it with straight face. And I'm listening to it on my earphones, on my own Zoom broadcast, and I'm thinking, where does this guy get this stuff? You know, I mean, Blind Freddy could see that it was the bad guys who tried to blow everybody up. And there might have been some people caught in crossfire. But he said it was an an extensive American plot to cover up their own failures. 
on the day. And so, anyway, the whole world has their view of things. So I, I ask you, you know, was the war, if someone says to me, was the war on terror worth it? And of course, without being too pedantic, I'd say, well, what do you mean by the war on terror? Was it that a thing that was invented after 19 guys in box cutters walked down three planes in three places? Or is it these people came looking for us? And, and uh, Americans started seeing things. They saw terrorists where there weren't any. And in this country, it even gets better. Um, after 9-11 in this country, because no one knows any European history or very few people, uh, because they don't want to study a foreign language anyway. They imagine that everything is ground, ground zero is the starting point. So we have to understand how extreme, Islamist extremists radicalize people. We have to understand Australians who go to their screens and are radical, self radicalized. How are they recruited and things like this? And, uh, they start to get paid millions of dollars to determine what words are on the screen, and what words are hitting their brain, etc. And and I, I and I've said to them that these people who are the burgeoning counterterrorism crowd, and I've said to the federal police and the Victorian anti-terrorist mob, I said if you want to know what terror is about, you look at the databases or the literature that exists for terrorists who came beforehand. Now. The Bader and Meinhof gang is a radical Marxist organization which counted on the same young people to offer up their lives. I mean, the connecting thing between terrorists, whether there are um, uh, anarchists from 150 years ago who had international conferences, by the way, to nihilists, to all these people in between, is the willingness to commit suicide. Okay, suicidal fanaticism. That's the bottom line. You know, when you're ready to give up your life for the cause, you're in a different game. You know, whether you're uh, a Viet Cong or uh, an Algerian peasant, I don't care who you are. When you're ready to give up your life, you're fighting a very, very different game. And so we started to imagine that uh, in this country, particularly in Australia, that we can get into their minds. So I point out to them, you don't have to get into their minds because they assume uh, counterterrorism people and stuff assume that the internet has changed everything. It's a brand new world. Actually, it's not a bad. I've argued with, uh, with you on, on numerous occasions that human nature hasn't changed in 2,500 years. The true, the good, and the beautiful, and the ugly are, are the same they've always been. And, and, and politics is a struggle for power. Nothing changes it. Even if you're a religious fanatic or anti-religious fanatic, it's about politics too. And so I say to these people, uh, why don't we look at other people and how the Nazis recruited people and the fascists and the Bolsheviks, the anarchists, nihilists, and look at maybe how the West Germans recruited uh, uh, terrorists, recruited other people, and the Italians, the liberal game. And uh, see, that spoils their game because they got people paying them to look at Australian prisons and whether they're radicalized in prison. And I always say to them, we're looking at the wrong thing. Now, one day, uh, I agreed to write a book with a Japanese neuroscientist who's at Berkeley and an American defense lawyer at the University of West Virginia. I, I knew the West Virginian guy. And he said to me, you want to write a book about the language of terror? And you and I will set up the scene. And my friend will examine how neurons work in these situations. And so the Japanese neuroscientist is able to show that almost all terrorism forever is about neurons. Certain people, people, certain people have the neurons to accept authority. Other people, their neurons tell them to reject authority. It's a good example of heresy and heterodox, you know, whatever it is. Some people will go with it. Some people don't believe a word. These are the people that terrorists tap. It's called The Language of Terror. And when I, I agreed to write the book. It's like a joke. 
a Chicago joke. You know, you go into a bar with an Irish lawyer and a Japanese neuroscientist, and you come out with a book called The Language of Terror. And I swear to God, when the book came out, it was reviewed in journals dedicated to biosecurity. I never heard of biosecurity, which is about neurons and things like that. So I say to the cops and the prosecutors, we, we have to look at the, the mental makeup of these people, not the words they're looking at the screen or beheadings or whatever it is. And then I, I said to these uh, Australian Federal Police in, in Sydney at, at a workshop that was convened for me. I said, look, the secret to terrorism not a bunch of kids blowing off their, blowing off steam on a street corner. See, the Australian definition of terrorism allows the Australian Federal Police and ASIO to drive to the war. So they go to the western suburbs of Sydney and they get a couple of big shots on the corner and they claim they got some terrorists. That's not the war for terrorists. It's a bunch of guys just blowing off steam. But you know, the Australian definition allows them to drive to the war. They don't have to learn anything, a foreign language. You don't have to get any shots or anything. You know, you just arrest the guy around the corner. Now, I say to these people, uh, we, we should be looking at how the West Germans handled the modern Meinhof gang, which were killers, you know, they were terrific. And then look at how the Italians handled the Red Brigade, which killed the former prime minister, President Moro. Hmm. They're all suicidal packs. And I said, there's a ton of literature out there. And I said, and you notice that there hasn't been a mass casualty attack on Italian soil since the late 1970s because the Italians knew how to deal with it. And there hasn't been a mass casualty attack in Germany because the West Germans know how to deal with it. Then I said to my audience, all oh, these great big, funny, you know, the Australian Federal Police are counter terrorism crowd. They're all about six foot two, they're Irish, with blonde hair, blue eyes. They like to drink beer. And I said to them, of course, you don't want to study the West Germans because that would require learning a foreign language. And you don't want to study how the Italians suppress the river game because you don't like wogs. You can't do that. You got to learn a foreign language. And then you have to say the Italians did something that nobody else could do. And as they crushed them. And it's in the literature. And I'm very interested. I mean, I know that the West German experience and the Italian experience would tell us how to handle terrorism for the next hundred years in this country. But because there are so many people who say that we have to do word studies and now they, they created a whole industry and the industry is based on one thing. It's based on ignorance is that everybody who claims in this country to be a, uh, an expert on terrorism is a historical. That is, they don't know what the hell happened before 9-11. They don't know that bin Laden's experience in, in Afghanistan. They don't, they don't connect the dots with, the uh, Black Hawk down. They don't connect the dots with the attempt to blow up the building. Uh, they don't look at earlier attempts. You know, when I was a younger man, the PLO was blowing up airplanes on tarmacs in the Middle East without hesitation. Uh, when I was a young kid, the, the Mau Mau was killing white people in Kenya because they just happened to be around the corner. And, and, and the Malaysian... Uh, Communist Party was being suppressed by the, uh, the British who had intruded on them. You know, there been all kinds of examples of how you deal with terrorism. Mm. And uh, I, I was lucky enough to cover Mandela's release, and I got to talk to a number of people who worked in ANC and got to look at the, uh, the trial records of Mandela. Mandela was a hardened terrorist. He was one of the inventors of the, the militant wing of the ANC, from Katowice's way, and he was also a bomber. Terrific. You could put a bomb together. And yet, he deprogrammed himself in prison and became the inevitable leader, great leader of these people. And so the people looking at terrorism, they don't know what they're looking for. And that's what drives me crazy. So when we say we're leaving the Middle East now because job well done, I think, I think what John Fairbanks said, he was the head of the China Institute at Harvard during the Vietnam War. He said, not only were we culturally blind to what we were doing, but he said, when we left, we don't know what we don't know. We don't even know what we didn't know. And uh, Don Rumsfeld kind of played, and he riffed on this once, and he gave that famous press conference about the known 
knowns and the unknown knowns and the known unknowns. And I've actually seen him on a special uh, on this. And he was playing with words, but he was really saying what John Fairbank was saying, that not only do we leave, not only do we enter a war ignorant, but we are ignorant of our ignorance. And that's whole 20 years in the war on terrorism, we have been ignorant of our ignorance. So when people say, what are the lessons to be learned? You know, everyone wants a goddamn uh, commission on, you know, the Australian, Americans, Brits. Let's have a commission on what we've learned on the war on terror. Nada. They learn nothing because they don't know what the war on terror is because there wasn't a war on terror. It was the uh, Bush administration's idea of rounding up the troops to get these 19 guys in box cutters. There was no war on terror. There were a bunch of guys who had it in for us and wanted to pay us a visit. It was a home game. So we don't like home games. We like visitors games. We like to be you know, 20 and one out on the road. We don't want any home games. So when they brought the game home, and we were, it were easy pickets. And that day when I saw that the entire American government was relying heavily on CNN for reporting about what was going on, after I'd heard all summer in the New York Times that there was this chatter that there was an attack planned in America, a major attack. But, of course, they didn't know what it was. They just knew there was a lot of chatter. And then we find out, through this commission, that there were people in Arizona or New Mexico who reported to their local FBI that there were some very strange young men who wanted to fly 747s but not learn how to land them. And they thought it was suspicious. And they were, Jesus, you think that would set off all the green lights at once? Mm. And, and they brought this information to New York and they found out that the New York people didn't share it with other organizations. People don't want to share intelligence. Why? Because they don't want to give away their, their secrets or their contacts. You know, it's very, very hard to do. So when the super organization came along and said, we're all going to share. Well, and you're only going to share what you want people to share. Hold back other things. But there were all kinds of things uh, about what was happening. And we, 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 we didn't connect the dots. Now, today, in the last uh, 10 years, America's had 100% conviction of terrorists in American courts. And that's because I heard from the American lawyers that they always used uh, informants, people who, sleepers, people who had penetrated these organizations. Now, I knew that when I was talking to the Australian Federal Police. So you got all these big guys, all six foot two. They look like, they look like the Irish rugby team, for God's sakes. And I'm trying to think, what, what organization would they penetrate? Would they go deep cover in Australia to be an Arab terrorist? I mean, the only reason we ever got the, the Vietnamese and the Chinese gangs in New York is because we, we penetrated the gangs with our own people. But Australia doesn't have the, the, the people to infiltrate these organizations if there is a serious attack. So we got a lot of energy, you know. You know Asio still is tracking, I think, uh, 350, 400 people who came back from the wars of the Middle East as potential um, serious terrorists who could train other people. And, you know, to, to track someone, to, to trail them, requires 22 people, 24-7. It's the mm. number. You need 22 people to follow someone for 24-7. So we're we going to do that. So once again, I get back to the idea that Ozio finally found a war to drive to, get these guys who are coming back. Mm. So uh, Australia is look, it's trying very hard. It doesn't use – I'd like to see a little more work on the neurological aspects of this. So I'm not a scientist. I do understand what the, the scientist was telling me about what to look at. Maybe brainway is the way to get through this. But to look at some some kid who's self-radicalizing in the basement of his house on the west side of uh, Sydney seems to me to be a waste of time. You know, I mean the other thing is the other Australian fairy tale to make us all feel good at night is that the person who gets through some crazy bastard who runs everybody over at the Burke Street Mall here in Melbourne, that they were lone wolves. Same thing for the guy at the, uh, uh, 
the guy at the uh, the chocolate place in Sydney at the Lit Cafe. Hmm. I got in a lot of trouble that day. I was on the ABC when the story broke, and I heard that the Hullsbury crowd, Hullsbury crowd, those sharpshooters who had been protecting President Obama, uh, Obama the week before, wanted to take this guy down in the first ten minutes. And the South uh, or the Sydney police commissioner told him, back off. Okay, they wanted to take him down. And I argued on air that we're going to find out we know who he was. We always do. No one connected the dots. And number three, I come from Chicago. When someone's pointing a gun at me, conversation's over. Okay? I don't want to hear about your troubles or your mama or your daddy or your bad religion. I don't want to hear. You're pointing a gun at me. Discussion is over. And I said that and I walked out of the show and I I got about a hundred obscene phone calls. Americans want to kill everybody, et cetera. And then, of course, uh, the coroner uh, believed what I said, that they changed the rules because people argued that when someone's pointing a gun at you. Now, I, I, I got to, uh, I gave a talk at a rotary about three years ago in Melbourne, across from the Parliament House, some famous cricket hotel. And I was there to talk about Trump. And this guy knew that I had taken a, an interest in the coronial inquest about the guy. At Lint, who, by the way, uh, was a known terrorist. He was thought to have killed his first wife. I mean, this guy sh- shouldn't have been out in the street. And as this guy comes up to me, this older guy, he says, uh, I want to tell you you're right about the terrorists, because the cops actually believe me. You know, they, they stood up for me when no one else would. And he said, uh, you're right about it. You must presume. It's a terrorist. At that time, your police commissioner was arguing that it was a uh, a negotiation, that it was a hostage situation. And when he said that night that uh, we have the best negotiators in the world, I'm thinking, I'm just going crazy. I almost put my fist in the TV screen. They're in a candy shop. Blood sugar is running low. And this guy wants to negotiate with him till dawn. It's just a matter of time before the guy went off. Anyway, the guy in, in, at the end of the rotary thing, about 80 years old, comes up to me and he says, I want to thank you for supporting the decision. You know, I say now, if you see the guy with the gun, you have to presume it's a live situation. And he said to me, Simon, that he was one, he was a sharpshooter with New South Wales and he was called over to Tasmania when Martin Bryant had seized all those people and started killing them. And he said he had a clear shot at Bryant before he'd done all of his damage. And the police commissioner of the authority in Tasmania told him to stand down. It's a negotiating situation. And he said he hasn't had a night's sleep in 30 years. He had the shot. And he didn't take it. And I thought, now there is a guy who knew how to deal with terrorism. And just finally here, on terrorism. Terrorism just isn't about Islamist extremism. It's about a lot of things. It's on a spectrum. The FBI defined uh, terrorism. They had, they had a description which is used today. Uh, terrorism comes in two kinds. It's uh, external terrorism. And homegrown domestic terrorism. So today, a lot of people who are big supporters of Black Lives Matter argue that we should be getting these white crazy people out on the spectrum. That's not what the definition was. It was about extremist terrorism and homegrown domestic terrorism. And there's always been that, whether it's in New Zealand, Australia, Britain, or the United States. There's always that. I mean, the, the good guy who, the good looking farm guy who brought down those buildings in Oklahoma was a good old boy. You know, he was just a farmer. And he brought the place down and killed 400 people. You don't have to be an Arab terrorist to be a terrorist. And, and so, or the guy that goes up into a hotel in Vegas shoots everybody at a concert. Remember that one? And, and so, terrorism, we don't even have the right definition. Uh, it's Terrorism is the privatization of terror. It's where an individual or a group of individuals decide to take it upon themselves to take lives. And so it could be one person or whatever. 
Now, get back to the Australian yarn. Australians tell people at night if there's a, a terrorist attack is through. That was a lone wolf. Now, I, I criticize this on television, radio. Now, I, I've written three volumes on the Kennedy years. It was about 300 pages on Lee Harvey Oswald and the Warren Commission. And I could see right away at the Warren Commission, when, he, when the Warren Commission came out and said that Lee Harvey Oswald was the sole shooter, perpetrator, only guy who planned to kill President Kennedy that afternoon. That there was something wrong with this picture. Okay. And the only thing I I really learned from the official uh, inquiry was that he was he could shoot a rifle and he had the personality to do it. He had the soul of a killer. Okay. I could see that. I could see that. And I've said on air and other places that there's no such thing as a lone wolf because before these people act, there are people around them who see what they're doing and they don't want to turn their nephew in or their kid or some neighbor down the block. You know, you don't want to do that to anybody. You don't know if they're serious or not. I said, there are no lone wolves. Lone wolves is what we say when we want people to feel good and we don't know the answer. And so some guy calls me up out of the blue at work and says, do you like to be on a commission on lone wolves? The psychology of lone wolves. I said, there are no lone wolves. I don't want to be in this commission. I said, the last lone wolf was Lee Harvey Oswald. I said, do you believe that? Do you believe that Lee Harvey Oswald, who was then killed the next day in police custody by a, a cancer-ridden former member of the mafia, a guy who has spent time in the Soviet Union and Cuba is, is a lone wolf. Is this possible? I mean, it defies imagination. There are no lone wolves. And so my point is, it's simpler and more complex than we thought it was. But there are a lot of people, you know, who've got these kind of working definitions. Now, look, Australians, like Americans and Brits and others, have done a wonderful job of preventing mass casualty attacks on Australian, British, and American soil. Done a great job. That's because they've hardened the borders. It is hard to get in here with a box cutter. It is even harder to hijack a plane. And yes, has air travel become miserable? Absolutely. It is the most onerous thing we can ask someone to do is get on an airplane and go overseas. It is a pain in the ass. It is just no fun anymore. It used to be fun, but it's not fun anymore. And so they've done a great job. But to have stopped the mass casualties, did you have to go to war with half the Middle East? Did you have to get involved in Afghanistan and Iraq and Yemen and Libya and Syria? It was that all necessary? The answer is no, it wasn't. But we've justified all that as a result of first getting into war by declaring war against Islamic terrorism after 9-11 and then carrying it out in different places. You know, and then as soon as you start to lose people, you know, when people start dying, and, and, and when our good people start to commit their own acts of terrorism, I mean, you know, in wartime, a lot of things are off the table, including restraint. And people say to themselves, it all had to be worth it because we were there and we lost lives. And, you know, the other day I got in terrible trouble. I, I said the war in Afghanistan really wasn't a war. It was kind of an action. It was a war. We didn't go into tanks. We just bombed the hell out of the place and landed some troops. And some guy who had uh, served in the SAS uh, got in touch with me and gave me some very nasty emails about it. Uh, it was a real war. I don't know anything about war. He threatened me by watching me closely and blah, blah, blah. I get threats all the time. But the point is, when you start losing your buddies in these places, the war then takes on a significance that it never had. It's like this. I look at the, the war memorial when I wake up in the morning from my 17th floor apartment. I think of all the people that died to make that war memorial possible and all the importance we attach to it that they would never have dreamed of attaching to it. But, you know, when you're in a war where there are no body pieces to bring back, 
you have all you have are memories. And when you lose your buddies and your men, men and women in these places, all you have are your memories. You start to imagine these memories are what the war was all about. It may not be what the war was all about at all. But, um, you know, I'm going to use my old friend here, Mark Twain, who says, you know, why, why Bush did what he did, and other people did what they did. Mark Twain says in his memoirs that we don't really know what goes on in someone's mind when they make a decision. You know, they, they can write their memoirs and it's all bullshit. We never know what's going on in people's minds. And so all I have is a professional story. It's this. I know what people did when they had the power to do what they did or the power not to do what they did. I hold people to accountability when they had power. I'm not interested in some sob story, two-volume memoir later on about things they couldn't tell us or things that they did and couldn't tell us or justifications. <clears throat> I hold people to accountability when they had the power to do something about it. And when I hear President Biden say, we are leaving this forever war, which he coined himself, was part of his, uh, his campaign rhetoric. Or as Tony Blair says, imbecilic rhetoric. To pivot to the Indo-Pacific to take on the Chinese, which is the, the fantasy story of the 21st century. Chinese aren't going to start a war. Not a chance. And we're not going to war with the Chinese over Taiwan or over Hong Kong or the Uyghurs. It's not going to happen. We might get in a war with them by accident or inadvertence over freedom of freedom of navigation. That's possible. They might stumble into a war, but they're not going to start a war. This idea that we have to gear up for the next war. Um, once again, this is the blob reconstituting itself in Washington. After the Soviet Union fell and after the wars of uh, terrorism fell, uh, collapsed. The new enemy now has to be a rising China and emerging. And I've been arguing even in China, this is not a rising power. They've been around 3,000 years. It is about the insecurity of the Communist Party, which thinks it has about 70 years to live because these parties do not last. Communist parties don't last more than five generations. It's hard to keep the revolutionary zeal going. This is when the Soviet Union and at the end of 67 years, that Bolshevik party lasted that long. And, and the Chinese know that they may not be able to pass it on to the next generation, which is why they're so obsessed with controlling TikTok, internet time, what they do and what they don't do. I mean, they're, they're very concerned about this. And the, the Chinese communists see that the sands are coming out of the hourglass, that they know that the, the average life of the communist party ruling the country is about 70 years, five generations. Or they have their own history, there are 249 dynasties in Chinese history, and they average out 70 years. So what Xi is worried about is losing control of the party. Now, the Chinese are completely capable of regime change themselves. I predict in five years that the communists will be gone, they'll be replaced by another uh, nationalist government, you know, it's only so long that 90 million people can shut out 1.3 billion people. You know, it's only a matter of time. And so they're, 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 moving, they're, they're making moves out of desperation. Not, they're not emerging. What they are is frightened. And they're, they're doing things because they see history is against them. In 1914, people in the German parliament talked about our time is running off. The Slavic races will be greater than the German races. The Aryans will be buried alive. This idea that time is not on your side is what drives people to madness. That's what drives the Chinese. And in this country, you know, we can't wait to buy F-35s, which are too expensive. Now we're into nuclear boats, which can only be designed. You know, we all have nuclear boats. We can sink the Chinese Navy in three days. And then what happens? Chinese take uh, nuclear shots at Americans in Okinawa or in Korea, and then they, 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 ramp, they ramp it up to another level. But, you know, Australians, like American public, 
count on the foreign policy establishment to settle these things for them, to give them the best options. Then we count on politicians taking the best advice and making considered choices. George W. Bush took this revenge, feeling of revenge, and he turned it into a war which lasted 20 years. And we didn't get anything for it. We didn't turn anybody into a Democrat. Well, we, we can't change how people feel about who goes to school. I mean, you know, we could try. And we, we never got our money or our time for it. And at the end of the day, the American people know in their heart of hearts, and they're not stupid. You know, even uneducated Americans, they have enormous common sense. They know when they've been played. They know when they've been asked to make sacrifices. The only reason the war on terror was popular at all is because it was carried out by a professional army of 1% of the American people. 1% of 333 million people carry the rifle into strange places. We've had 800 bases overseas. And so we regarded these, these people now are the foundation of this American dream overseas about recreating things. And everything falls to them. There's a mystique about them now. After the Vietnam War, Americans spit on soldiers returning from Vietnam. Today, Americans will stop you in the street. Thank you for your service. Give you the plate. We give you a hamburger. Change places on an airplane. This is that guilt from treating Vietnam veterans very badly, and that's why one of the things that President Nixon got rid of to make war more popular was to get rid of the draft. You know, if you got a real war, then you tax for a war. All the wars on terrorism were done on credit cards. The wars were not fought by a national draft; they're fought by a professional army people mm -hmm. with a different set of criteria about how to move forward. So unless you have a real war is a draft and you task for it and you prepare, a nation goes to war. War is organized violence. So the war against the terror is not a war of organized violence against another group. It's a very selective war against certain people under the guise of the war. It's easier to call something a war. You know, it's a little classier. It's a little more systemic. It's the war on terror. Well, what, what, what war is that all about? So I get back to my, uh, my famous analogy. What would George Washington or Thomas Jefferson have to say about an American spearhead on the banks of Babylon? <laughs> they, they wouldn't believe it that America had traveled that distance to instill uh, this kind of thing. Now, in the 1820s, a crusty old guy from New England, John Quincy Adams, who was president once, no, when he's secretary of state, he says, the Greeks want help. There's a democracy movement in Greece in the 1820s. And they, they want assistance. The way the, the Poles did in the revolution of 1848. All these movements around. And John Quincy Adams writes about the, the Greek request for troops. He says that, it's America wishes freedom well, but we do not go in search of monsters to destroy because at the end of the day, the monster will destroy you. So to fight the war on terrorists, we had to get in the, down the same level with them. And you know, I think the perfect, everyone talks about, uh, Americans, when they want to prove a point, and it sounds funny, they talk about the inflection point. This is an inflection point. What it means is, I've had no life before you ask me this question. I will tell you my inflection. And I don't know any history, so I'll tell you this inflection. The inflection point is when President Biden gets up there to describe the, the lift, airlift from um, Kabul. He's talking about the attack on these Americans and Afghans. He says so. He says, like Liam Neeson in this movie, Take It. He says, we know who you are and we're coming for you. Who talks like that? It's like a grade B movie. Then the next day he announces 
that we have destroyed operatives who were involved in the mass killing at the airport. And then we find out through the New York Times, these two kids, uh, New York Times has a, uh, an audio column, these guys who work in Kabul. And after the, uh, the attack, they drove to the neighborhood where it happened. Everyone in the neighborhood knew who got killed. And so they drive in a backyard and they got blood and flesh everywhere. And 10 kids were killed from one family. And these two kids in their 20s report to New York that they discovered the scene of the, the attack on the ISIS operatives. And it was a guy who delivered water for an NGO. And it's all wrong. They got everything wrong. So then the third day, we are the third uh, part of the, the puzzle here. We get the head of the American forces, General Maxwell, saying that uh, we killed the wrong people. They were innocent. So we get the president saying, we're coming for you. Day two, he says, we got you. And then we have the head of the operation saying, these were innocent people. What's wrong with this picture? It's all wrong. American intelligence stunk in nineteen or in two thousand one, and I don't think it's any better off today. You know, it tends to be parsed, parceled, compartmentalized, and then sold at different levels. Unless you want to leak it to the press, someone tells someone tells me we can control the war on terror over the horizon with these Reaper missiles. Now that Reaper missile. Started in Las Vegas, a little town outside of Vegas. It's probably done by some guy, single father, who had to get home by four o'clock to get his kid at soccer. And they just go, you know, they just take over the thing and launch them. How do you kill 10 kids in a courtyard when you got the visual? Uh, how can you be sure? How can you be anything? Who kills 10 kids? I mean, you see, what we've done is the war on terror, quotes, has, I think, drawn us into a world of madness where what we do looks as bad as what the terrorists do, except we got names for it. We think we can apologize when we're done. Those are 10 lives lost. Your 10 souls are gone. And I don't think it's acceptable to apologize. I don't know what the answer is, but you got to stop doing that kind of thing and maybe let things play out. And so when the war on terror ends with the slaughter of 10 innocent children, you start to ask yourself, what was this all about? Does it make any sense? And at the end of the day, the war on terror only brought us one positive relief, and that was no mass attacks on American soil. Could we have done that without the war on terror, without the war in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria? Yemen, Libya. Could we have done that? I think so. But I'm not a genius about this. All I did was look at the experiences of Vietnam and cultural blindness and the arrogance. And I looked at all the people around George W. Bush who decided to cash in their chips on winning the Cold War. And they got it all wrong. And by the way, when Liz Cheney, the congresswoman from Wyoming, so that Donald Trump should be uh, shamed and arrested in an engagement for this insurrection of the Capitol. And I think of the lies her father told in the war on terror and the war, weapons of mass destruction, getting us involved in a place we had no business getting involved in. And I think of this woman, probably a good woman, who says that Trump got it all wrong and he's really a criminal. And her daddy, who got us all involved, involved there on a piece of fabricating evidence, she knew was wrong. She doesn't mention him. And I'm thinking, we, we get all these children of, you know, in a real world that was equal. Her father, George W. Bush, Secretary of State Paul, and, and Dick Cheney would have all gone to the Hague at a war crimes tribunal, and they would have all been filled guilty of war crimes. But, you know, now we get back to the real world, which looks like the ancient world, and that famous dialogue, 
and the powerful do what they can and the weak do what they must. Thank you. You've been listening to the World Garden Podcast. For more episodes just like these or to join our community, go to thewalledgarden.com. See you there.